Chapter 19, Dr. Riva's Secret. I wonder what it is. What a huge difference the removal of Dubenguan made. Matt had taken so many problems that he felt paralyzed, and now he, couldn't, he could relax. He could take his time with the other tasks. He, has, he has accessed the hollow part that afternoon over Dr. Riva's strong objections and contacted banks in Switzerland, South Africa, and Japan to move money into the accounts of the new doctors. He sent a message to Esperanza to find qualified nurses and lab technicians. The hospital had to be built up before they could start work on the Egypts. Matt had never handled actual money. It wasn't used in opium, but he understood the concept of buying and selling he had studied the ebb and flow of currency and knew that so many U.S. dollars equaled so many pesos, rubles, or rands. That's from South Africa. Banking was merely a set of numbers to Matt. It was good to have high notes. And, it, and if they fell below a certain point, you moved a few tons of opium around and magically the numbers went up again. Drugs were the real money. Drugs and gold. El Patron had a lot of that too. For the first time, Matt appreciated the power he had. He could buy anything he wanted. A castle in Spain, a spaceship, an Egyptian pyramid, and have it shipped to him. When the boys visited, he would throw them a party that would outdo El Patron's birthdays. And it wouldn't include boring speeches, or stiff formal dinners. What did Tonton like? Soccer. Matt would have the top soccer teams from Argentina and Brazil flown in. Chacho liked music. Matt would invite the best guitarist in the world. Fidelito liked wrestlers, or rather, Fidelito's grandmother had liked wrestlers, and told him stories about them. The little boy's eyes lit up when he talked about El Pretzel, so-called because he tied his opponents into knots. Another favorite was El Serrero, the salt shaker who threw salt into people's eyes when the referee wasn't looking. But El Monaco was the best. He was so noble, he never played dirty tricks, and so good-looking that girls fainted when he stepped into the ring. Planning the party made Matt feel feverish, and in fact, he did have a fever. Dr. Rivas ordered him to bed, and Matt thought, I don't have to go to bed. I'm a drug lord. I can do anything I want. But he was too tired to argue. He awoke refreshed and full of confidence. It was time to return to Ajo. The doctors would arrive in a few days, and he had to prepare for the party. And he missed Celia, Daft Donald, and Mr. Ortega. With his newly found power, he wanted to give them all presents. But he realized that he couldn't give them things they really wanted. Daft Donald would want his voice back, and Mr. Ortega, his hearing. As for Celia, what reward was good enough for her complete devotion? He was feeding Marisol breakfast in his hospital bedroom when Cienfuegos slunk in. The Jeffy closed the door carefully and ran a kind of wand over the walls, ceiling and floor. Expecting trouble, Matt said, picking fragments of toast from the front of the girl's uniform. Avoiding it, Cienfuegos said. I declare this room free of listening devices and spy cameras. That's good, said Matt absently. A drug lord should never be this relaxed. The Jeffy said, you act as though you haven't a care in the world, brushing crumbs off your pet Egypt, while who knows what plots are being hatched behind your back. Even El Patron took holidays, retorted Matt. He did when he was, he did when he was old and had a system of bodyguards and sicarios in place. When he was young, he slept with his eyes open. Matt sighed. 
Could I send for Dr. Rivas? No. Cienfuegos barked. No. He repeatedly, he repeated more softly. Dr. Rivas is the problem. How can I believe you? He saved my life. The Jeffy pulled up a chair and leaned close, as though he expected someone to be eavesdropping. He's brilliant. He's a brilliant scientist. But he has a family to protect, and that compromises him. Matt took a, a second look at San Fuegos as an idea began to surface in the back of his mind. I know Dr. Rivas came here with his father, wife, and three children. The father died of a heart attack, and his wife killed herself when El Patron turned one of their sons into an Egypt. The Egypt is still alive, which is amazing for someone so profoundly chipped, but the doctor has devoted his life to protecting him. I believe you saw the young man removing leaves from a pond. Matt remembered Dr. Rivas must have chosen the veranda so he could watch his son. The other two? They work in the large observatory you saw when we flew in. What we must remember is that the doctor would do anything to protect them. Cienfuegos leaned back, watching Matt expectantly. After a moment, he said, Waitress, go to the kitchen. She rose at once but paused to look at Matt. It's all right. Please go to the kitchen. The boy said, Did you see that? Explained the Jeffy after she left. She waited to get your permission. Maybe she likes me. She was trained to obey everyone, not make choices about who to obey. Cienfuego said, the cooks say the jitters when she's away from you. The cooks say she jitters when she's away from you. That's a danger sign. Egypts break down if they're under too much stress and they can die. Matt was appalled. He, had, he hadn't meant to put her in danger. What should I do? Stop trying to awaken her, Nick withdrawn. Let the doctors do it. Right now, we have a much more important problem on our hands. Dr. Rivas has been lying to you. More trouble, thought Matt. You crawl out of, you crawl out from under one rock and another rolls into its place. He was already, he was ready to start jittering himself. What, what, what about, it's better if I show you. Follow my lead, said Cienfuegos. Following his lead meant wandering through the gardens as a Jeffy explained which plants he planted to collect for Esperanza. He already trapped several kinds of squirrels. There were so many around, all you had to do was hold out a peanut and they jumped into your arms. He was digging up wildflowers and collecting seeds. You have to collect them as complete communities, he explained. You can't mix the ones growing in alkaline soil at a thousand feet with those in acid soil at 5,000 feet. You also have to collect the bacteria and fungi living with them. Matt wasn't interested in soil samples, but he guessed that the conversation was a cover for their real purpose. He knew the hidden microphones and cameras were scattered all over paradise. El Patron had been addicted to spying. Dr. Rivas could keep track of their movements. But what difference did that make? The doctor had a family, and now the idea that had begun to surface in Matt's mind became clear. He knew little about the outside world, except what he'd seen on television. On TV, people had brothers, sisters, sons, and daughters. Tantan had parents. So did Chacho. Fidlito had a dearly loved grandmother. No one in opium had a family, except the Alcarans and their visitors. No one else got married until Matt had met the boys at the plankton factory. He hadn't realized how abnormal life in opium was. They came to outdoor. They came to an outdoor shrine, dedica dedicated to Jesus Malverde, and Matt was embarrassed to see a small plaster statue of the young El Patron draped with silver charms. San Fuegos bowed his head and crossed himself. That's not a real saint, Matt said. I am directing my prayer to God, the Jeffy replied. It doesn't matter who delivers the message. Directly behind the shrine was a building almost completely hidden in vines, and Matt heard a girl yell, Don't touch me! It was listen. He started to run, but Cienfuegos 
held him back. Let me handle this, he said. Matt saw that standing in the shadows on either side of the door were bodyguards in the distinctive black suits El Patron had favored, so that they had not at all died at the funeral. So they had not all died at the funeral. Some had been kept that here, and Matt wondered why. Cienfuegos casually walked toward the men and said, I've come to fix the electrical problem. What electrical problem? growled one of the guards. The current is leaking into the wall, and anyone touching it gets a shock, said the Jeffy. Nobody told me about it, said the other guard. Dr. Rivas just contacted me. He's afraid one of the children will get electrocuted. That woke the, card, the guards up. Crap! I didn't know wires could leak. Have you got a pass? The first man asked. Right here. San, San Fuegos started unfolding a piece of paper, and the two men bent over to read it. Suddenly, with the speed that made Matt's heart leap into his mouth, the Jeffy flicked a stun gun from the shoulder holster and shot both of them twice. You killed them, the boy cried. Not quite, said Sanfuegos, prodding one of them with his foot. You need two shots from, for some of these gorillas. He bent down and, and relieved the men of their, weapon, of their weapons. But why? They were no danger to me. I am the Patron. Only if they think you are, said the Jeffy. They are microchipped. They can't attack me any more than you. The minute Matt, Matt said it, he realized his mistake. The farm patrol were chipped, and they didn't want to be reminded of it. A look of pure fury crossed Cienfuegos' face. He leaned, across, he leaned against the door frame, breathing heavily. Celia told you, didn't she? He said shivering with repressed emotion. Don't blame her. I am the Patron. I am supposed to know everything, said Matt. She said everyone was. He searched for a word controlled. You could call it that. But your intelligent isn't but your intelligence isn't harmed, Matt said, trying to persevere or preserve the, the Jeffy's honor. Too bad they didn't leave my soul alone, Cienfuegos laughed sh shakily. Dr. Rivas is probably wetting his pants right now if he's watching the monitors. Come on, you have to know what's, what he's hiding. Hey guys, if you like this, please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you. And please listen to chapter 20, The Bug.